this whole idea about uh, the role of evidence and appealing to nature and to facticity to uh, prevail in political argumentation is neither new nor limited to any particular culture. It is universal and historically very well established. Cast your minds back, those of you who studied uh, philosophy, to Plato. He had a notion that the way the world is, this uh, epistemology, the ontology, somehow or other uh, justified his preferences for social organization, for politics, for an, uh, ethics. Fast forward, I don't know, what was it, 3,000 years, to Marx and Engels in the British Museum, sorry, in the pub outside the British Museum, actually getting very excited about what happens when you boil water. Why? Well, because when you boil water, nothing much happens until you reach 100 degrees Celsius, when it suddenly transforms from liquid to socialism. I mean, liquid to vapour. <laughs> uh, so we've got this idea that somehow or other appealing to nature is a very potent way of justifying moral and political preferences. But we don't experience nature directly in this uh, culture and at this point in history. We experience nature through the mediation of science. And so we now experience internal nature through, mediated through ideas of the health sciences and external nature mediated through the idea of environment and the environment sciences. And that's one of the reasons why both of those are extremely controversial. The second point I want to make is about the danger of using science as a surrogate arena for policy debates. What happened in the climate change issue was back in the very early congressional hearings, climatologists went in and told members of Congress, here's the diagnosis, here's the prescription. If you buy the diagnosis, you must do what we say, which is focus on carbon emissions reductions. So the only choice that was then left to Congress people was to either buy into the whole package or dispute the science. So what happened was the policy debate that we should have been ha having for at least two decades now about how do we respond to the challenges of climate change in the context of global development and so on and so forth uh, has been displaced into a surrogate argument of, uh, about the details of the science. And that's been extremely unhelpful. And the notion somehow or other that sorting out the science and getting the science right will drive people to change their value sets and their value commitments and the things that they care about in the much larger realm of human activity is fundamentally misguided and unhelpful. The notion that more and better science um, will dictate better policy, I've already suggested that's not true. There are myriad examples. There was the Nas National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program in the US, which ran for over a decade a multi-multi-million pound program never resolved what to do about acid rain uh, in the US. Science is, of course, an important informer of a policy debate, but so often in these debates we see the reduction of science to things like trigger thresholds. So we have the give me the number idea, different levels where somehow or other a number is seen to trigger uh, a p policy uh, response. And all of this, in my view, uh, leads to a discourse of management rather than to a discourse of democracy. And a discourse of management is one where citizens debate policy within the expert framing provided by science and do not have the opportunity to determine the terms of the debate. And the classic example of this, I think, has to be the GM Nation debate, where in my view, and that of many social scientists, what people really wanted to talk about was food in the countryside. And what they were allowed to talk about was a very, very narrow range of technical issues about the... Uh, uh, ecological implications of commercialising genetically modified crops. But when you close down the debate actually at its very inception, I would argue that locks you into a management discourse, not a democratic policy discourse, and I think that's very unhelpful. Science is probably the one area of human activity where we don't have publicly recognised experts who can make judgments of quality who are not themselves capable of performing the action that they are judging. If you think Wine and food, art, dance, uh, almost every area of human endeavor that you think of, we recognize the non-practitioner expert, the connoisseur, the maven, the person who, who is capable of judging, making judgments of quality and who to trust and who not to trust, even though they couldn't possibly perform that act for themselves. The one exception seems to be science. And science somehow has pulled off this trick of suggesting that only somebody who is fully qualified as a scientist is a person to make uh, appropriate judgments uh, across scientific disagreement. Connoisseurship arises in a different way. It doesn't arise from learning all the techniques of performance. It, it arises out of social networks of judgment of, of quality and reliability and so on. And I think that unless we can generate a, uh, a layer of popular connoisseurship of science, this c capacity for in uh, informed judgment, uh, it's the only way it seems that we can keep scientists on tap 
not have scientists on top. I'm here, I guess, as someone who's strongly supportive of evidence-based policy. Uh, and, I, and I guess I have that label, but I want to explain exactly what I mean and hope that will actually reassure the likes of Stephen and James uh, and even Tamandra. We don't argue, those of us who want to see in appropriate circumstances evidence-based policy, we don't argue that it should be the only factor or even ever uh, always a relevant factor, let alone the only factor. There is clearly in many policy decisions, I would say most policy decisions, a role for, for that old-fashioned thing, so ideology, political <laughs> ideology, um, economics, uh, there's some things that might be nice to have but aren't affordable, for equity and fairness arguments, which are very much to the fore at the moment, although obviously evidence underlying that uh, um, uh, comes into play there. There's that thing called, um, that, that might override evidence in certain areas, uh, called manifesto commitments, or if no one wins the election, coalition agreements made after the fact, but, but the best replacement for that. And there may be, you know, strongly held personal moral views, which people are allowed to, and should, if they're very clear about that, make policy on. But there are certain issues where I think, I would argue, though it's only an argument, it's not a rule, that the public would, should be in despair and highly critical if uh, evidence was not the basis for the decision. And I just scribbled a few down. Nuclear safety. I think the public shouldn't vote for a party that isn't going to base uh, its, uh, its um, policy on nuclear safety on the best available uh, evidence. Irreversible environmental damage which leave a legacy that can't be undone for future generations. I campaign for people to vote against politicians who don't base their policy on the best available evidence in respect of that issue. Now those are only a small number of things but, uh, but I think that gives you an idea of at least some areas where I think people should judge politicians on the extent to which they use the best available uh, evidence. Five things that I think policy makers and politicians uh, uh, should avoid when dealing with uh, evidence-based policy. I've called them laws, I was going to call them crimes, but I didn't want to be accused of being too, too didactic. The first law of evidence-based policy is not to claim something is evidence-based when it isn't, because polluting the vocabulary ruins the ability for people on those issues where they feel they want to make a democratic choice to understand the subject. So if the government rejects the view of the Advisory Council on the misuse of drugs, and if, they, and if the shadow minister does as well, they should do so on the basis that, yes, that's what the science says, but we're going to trump that because we believe that what's more important is, is appealing to the editor of the Daily Mail or whatever. The same with animal research. You can argue a very strong ethical case about using animals uh, to help save human life, but what you shouldn't do is claim that there have been no advances on the insight into knowledge of human diseases with embryology. You can make a, a legitimate ethical case that it's wrong to instrumentalize the human embryo, but you shouldn't say that there's nothing that, 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 uh, that embryonic stem cell res research doesn't work and that everything can be found in adult stem cells. That is misleading, and you don't, shouldn't rely on that. You should stick to your moral arguments. The same with abortion in 24 weeks. You can argue against uh, abortion, but I don't think you should try and distort the evidence as was attempted on 24 weeks. Second, third, and fourth, I'll very briefly, uh, don't interfere with the evidence. So you shouldn't design research uh, to fulfil a, a, a policy end. So famously, I think it was Patricia Hewitt wrote to the Independent saying that she thought home birth was safe and they were commissioning research to demonstrate that. <laughs> and it turns out she was right, but uh, I was much more concerned about the, the statement. Um, and interfering with the evidence involves putting pressure on independent scientific advisers by saying that you will sack them if you lose trust in them. And that's what this government has inserted into the ministerial code. And I think that's unfortunate. It's now a worse position than we had even before the David Nutt affair. Don't suppress the evidence. I'll give an example of that, hopefully, in questions. Don't overinterpret evidence. Don't say that if you've got one poor study, then that is it, and try and justify policy by that. There are plenty of other bases upon which to justify policy without uh, over-egging it. I've set out there five rules whereby we can actually encourage democratic choices, not have scientific evidence dictate the policy, but enable the democratic, uh, uh, the democratic process to judge how well policymakers, where appropriate, use that evidence.
It does seem obvious that uh, policy should have a very strong uh, basis uh, uh, in the available evidence, and, and the soundness of that, I think, is clearly demonstrated if you think about what the alternative would be, which is that policy, policy is uh, uh, grounded in ignorance, or, uh, 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 as Evan calls it, uh, 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 the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> we might very obviously want to raise the question of whose evidence, of which evidence. Science is complicated. Uh, uh, the complexity is revealed in uh, the available of potentially contradictory uh, pieces of evidence in answer to any one uh, uh, particular question. But none of that challenges the idea that uh, evidence can be found, uh, nor indeed that uh, policy could be grounded uh, very firmly and sensibly upon uh, uh, good uh, quality evidence. It simply points out that it's uh, difficult. I think there's a far more serious problem in uh, uh, what's going on in the discussion about uh, uh, evidence-based uh, policy, though. Something at, at a deeper level which actually uh, uh, is dangerous to both science uh, and to politics. From the perspective of uh, politicians who are engaged in the policy-making process, the appeal of an evidential basis uh, is, I think, quite obvious. Uh, making policy evidence-based allows political decision-making to appeal to uh, a high standard of truth, uh, of objectivity, of uh, uh, demonstrable uh, facts. But I think Evan demonstrates what, what it can mean uh, uh, in that regard, in the way that he frames it. You know, it's important that the public are therefore being given uh, a decision uh, based on the right kinds of evidence. There is a problem, though, that uh, uh, that evidential basis has therefore determined and set for us in advance what the actual question is uh, that we should be addressing or what the problem is. From the other side, I think, as scientists and, and social scientific researchers and, acad and academics, we can see the appeal of evidence-based policy because seeing one's research transformed into policy, uh, a basis for policy reform and initiative, demonstrates the importance of the research. It's flattering. Uh, uh, I, but I, I don't mean that in some kind of banal way. You know, particularly when you think about social sciences, most of us are interested in researching society because we want to improve it. We want to understand it. Uh, we want to make it better. We want to solve problems. And of course, when our research findings are transformed into policy, uh, surely that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, our research, our understanding of the world, is informing changes uh, uh, in the political sphere, which are aimed towards improving the society that we live in. So, so far, so good. Everybody uh, uh, has uh, obvious and straightforward and quite reasonable reasons uh, for liking uh, the idea of evidence-based policy, the evidence producers uh, and the politicians themselves. But I think once we've come to accept the central centrality of evidence-based policy across a whole range of different kind of decisions as we have uh, in society at the moment, um, what we've ended up with, I think, is a very degraded view of what politics is and a very degraded view of what science and what knowledge is. Evidence-based policy reduces the activity of politics to the more technical process of policy making. And I think evidence-based policy has reduced the content of science and knowledge of understanding uh, the world we live in uh, to the question of evidence. Obviously, politics is about far more than uh, policy making. Uh, uh, although policymaking is uh, hugely uh, uh, important uh, to politics. It's not the only thing, it's not the only way that politics can function or indeed uh, should be uh, understood. <coughs> Politics, as, as, as I think you know, other people have suggested, we're talking about conflicts of values about how the world should be organised. We're talking about conflicts of ideologies. We're talking about conflicts of ways of thinking and conceiving of ourselves, the society that we live in, and the future of that society, which are not empirically testable or empirically verifiable. It is the case, and I think this is important, that, that science, most scientific questions are things which I cannot contribute to as a scientist. I'm not. Uh, I don't have the expertise, uh, I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the understanding. I, I'm very keen on the idea that one can be a connoisseur uh, uh, of science, which is to say an intelligent layman who can pass opinion, but what one can't do, I think, is pass an opinion on whether a particular piece of scientific research is right or wrong uh, uh, in any particular case. The difficulty is that politics, obviously, is something that not only can I uh, uh, express an opinion on, but actually by virtue of having been born into society, it's something that uh, I do uh, have a capacity uh, and perhaps a responsibility to engage in uh, on a daily basis. The difficulty, therefore, is that when we reduce a, a whole range of political questions to questions of which bits of evidence we should trust, whether uh, 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 one piece of evidence that Evan thinks is more rigorous uh, on a particular question is better than and better evidenced uh, than another uh, uh, argument, which doubtless in the current discussion is going to be uh, making claims to some kind of different evidential base. The choice that we have is between these two rather more fixed 
uh, uh, levels uh, uh, of what political decision uh, we have. And I think the other thing that we do, incidentally, uh, is that we reduce uh, politics uh, to something which is about policy and questions about what is in the world, uh, questions about the particular truths and pieces of evidence that we can demonstrate at the moment. And we lose sight of politics in a far broader uh, transformative sense of what politics can be that actually involves both our engagement with the world and our engagement with ourselves and transforming uh, that world as we go along. If so many political questions uh, have to be based upon evidence as exists at the moment, we're stuck, I think, within a very conservative uh, uh, and managerial and administrative uh, uh, account and understanding of what politics contributes to society. And you might suggest that that's pretty much where we're at at the moment in terms of what politics is. My starting point, which I guess is shared by all of us here, is that evidence clearly does matter. And indeed, as our society changes and we become more diverse, with a greater range of moral and religious views, uh, evidence matters increasingly. There is the Rawls pub test of public reason, which is a kind of arguments that you can deploy, which will appeal to people coming from a range of religious and cultural and moral viewpoints. And that's a really important test in a modern democracy, a modern liberal democracy. And it does undoubtedly accentuate the importance of evidence. And as our sets of views become more diverse, I think that at the same time, science is generating richer and richer literally not just natural explanations of the physical world, but explanations of ourselves as human beings and how our brains work and how uh, cooperation evolves. Moving now to, uh, to my role as a practical politician in the coalition government, I would say the coalition is undoubtedly very good for evidence-based policy within government. When you're sitting around the cabinet or the cabinet committee table and you've got people from a different political party and you're trying to agree a way ahead, and you can't as assume tribal loyalty, you can't even appeal to things that were in your party's manifesto, you do find yourself increasingly drawing on um, evidence about what works, what doesn't work, all that. So that's the backdrop, which I think we can um, uh, share and accept. But at that point, the, I think qualifications begin. We mustn't be naive about what we think evidence-based policy means. And I would offer three qualifications. First of all, of course, the, uh, there are large numbers of different types of evidence. And even people who would regard themselves as practicing a scientific discipline have different views, uh, not just on policy, but even on identifying a problem. Economists often think about something in a very different way from a natural scientist does. Economists immediately think about opportunity cost, cost-benefit analysis, trade-offs. There's quite a lot of work done by natural uh, scientists or people trying to uh, uh, study uh, other phenomena, which doesn't seem to me to be p particularly driven by that kind of economist model. So economists sometimes write advice for us, which is pretty clearly dismissive of conclusions drawn by scientists from other disciplines on the ground they haven't actually done a proper cost-benefit analysis of things. So evidence, even rigorous evidence that comes within a scientific discipline, doesn't always reach the same conclusion. And secondly, of course, there is the yawning issue of the is-ought dilemma. To what extent are, is this evidence? Is it, um, uh, at best, facts? Or do policy proposals follow from it? And a lot of the material I read, as a layman again, has incredibly sophisticated analysis of data using statistical techniques that I find it hard to follow. And then the final couple of paragraphs about the implications for policy are often extraordinarily slapdash and just kind of assume that the implications of policy follow automatically from this incredibly sophisticated statistical analysis. One of the reasons why the IFS has got such strength in our public discourse is that the IFS analyzes policy options rigorously. And quite a lot of the material and evidence that's pushed forward just assumes that policy options follow obviously and are quite crude given um, a previous analysis. So, second point. We in politics are operating with limited time and limited information. We are GPs, not hospital consultants. You can't endlessly say, well, let's get another biopsy, let's do another round of x-rays, then we'll reach a view. You are reaching decisions in the here and now with very 
limited information. So secondly, you have to accept the decisions are taken imperfectly. And moreover, it's not just that they're taken imperfectly and you can immediately reverse them. Uh, you've got here an elaborate process of perhaps regulations being passed, propositions being advanced in the House of Commons, laws being made, statements of policy. In other words, once you've made these, even in rather imperfect conditions, you can't change them next week. So to what extent are politicians entitled to change policies frequently if we've taken them with imperfect information and the evidence appears to have changed? One of the things that voters clearly want is some kind of sense that when they vote for a party, they vote for a character of a government, a settled view of the world, something that constitutes a manifesto and a set of beliefs that will be put into effect over several years. And thirdly, the, 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 I think the deepest problem of the lot, which is that um, we're not a technocracy, we're a democracy. And a bloody good thing we're a democracy, technocracy. Uh, and the, therefore, uh, public attitudes and the values of our society matter. And if you want to put it in terms of an internal tension within the debate for evidence-based policy, you just say, well, is evidence on public attitudes legitimate evidence? If, you, I, if I, you could solve the problem with a neat sort of definitional trick, if you said that, of course, evidence-based policy is right and it has to include evidence on public attitudes, and then, of course, you've just got a new set of problems about which ratings you attach to different evidence. But public attitudes do matter, and they are the framework within which we function as a community. And uh, it's easy to dismiss them as prejudices, and of course people's views change over time, and one hopes that um, as the scientific way of thinking spreads, and I think it's one of the great <coughs> things that's happening in the world around us, that the scientific way of thinking is spreading, we may find that that in turn shapes public attitudes. But meanwhile, we are uh, servants of a national political community, and we're perfectly entitled as democratic elected politicians to take account of, of people's values. So those are the kind of constraints and limitations. But within them, and accepting those constraints, when you have at any given moment a piece of uh, a, a decision on public policy to take, it's right that we need to know what the empirical evidence is, both about the scale of the problem and perhaps about what works. But ultimately, it's ministers that have to take responsibility for the decision, not the advisors. Steve, I, I wanted to actually throw back at you something that um, David just said. In a society of very diverse opinions and views, that actually having some evidence that is, that is based on research that gives you some facts and figures, is that not a useful starting point from which you can start to have debates and democratic discussions <coughs> in a society that doesn't really have great cohering ideas? Well, uh, let me say that the first thing that struck me in uh, listening to the other panellists is actually how much convergence there is on the panel on principle. I think the devil, however, is in the details. And it's what happens, and because obviously uh, I wouldn't disagree with Evan when he uh, says, you know, nuclear safety is something that it's important to get the evidence right with respect to. But in my experience, what has counted in discussions about nuclear safety uh, varies tremendously uh, and for example and that there is a tendency <coughs> where there is a narrow factual basis um, which is scientifically determined no, no matter how small and narrow that is in a sense to stand up to try to stand on that bit of ground and I think it's actually dangerously misleading to believe that by narrowing the debate in that way you are actually overcoming uh, the value divergences that exist in society, I think you end up simply eliding them. But in those areas where it should matter, I think what's the alternative to evidence-based policy? I mean, I don't think James is arguing for fantasy-based policy. <laughs> uh, he'd, probably, um, he'd probably be a happier person than I've been over the last 15 years if he did like it, or, or pseudo-scientific based policy or anti-science based policy so in those areas where it is relevant you want there to be clarity and one example and it is the best example is the is the is the drugs one uh, illegal drugs because there is just this warped sense of harms even okay so people say uh, we've got to clamp down and criminalize young people because there's evidence that for example cannabis use causes harm drugs screw you up 
but criminal records screw you up. And that is completely ignored by politicians and most of the media, and that is extremely frustrating. The difficulty there is twofold, I guess, that, that on the one hand, what we're entirely missing from the discussion about drugs and drugs policy is the question of uh, individual freedoms, the question of whether or not the state should be determining uh, uh, whether or not individuals are free or not to take drugs, and should be making those decisions on the basis of evidence about relative uh, uh, levels of harm that one drug causes over another. So that's one important level upon which uh, we uh, uh, end up with, I think, quite a peculiar and limiting kind of debate. As soon as you move from just trying to describe the natural world to anything that engages with human behaviour, I think you have to take account of attitudes, what we understand about what shapes our behaviour. It's very hard to see any kind of rational debate on policy that doesn't take account of all that. Within that, of course, the one extreme is what does the poll show this morning in the papers? That's one time heaven. But what if there's evidence that people think dying in certain ways is more distressing or more to be avoided than dying in certain other ways? You often tell people talk about risk. Maybe societies have different views about risk which can't be completely captured just in is this dangerous or this is not. Dangerous. Maybe there are some dangers that we care about more than other dangers. And maybe the evolutionary biologists are quite good at explaining and beginning to explain why there are some dangers we care about more than other dangers. Uh, so are we supposed to dismiss all that and say, no, we can actually just calculate some kind of risk of physical harm and then that's the criteria. That's actually a very strong kind of set of evaluative judgments in their own right. So as a politician, I certainly think our own attitudes are perfectly uh, legitimate as, as one of the pieces of evidence that we're entitled to take into account, yeah. The problem with science in policy making is there's both too much of it and too little of it at times, which is that we've had experiences where it took the government six weeks, for example, to speak on the MMR debate, or where they kicked out to a scientific committee issues around GM crops, previous, the previous government are talking about, um, in the hope that scientists would play the role that politicians really should be playing, uh, which I think was an act of political cowardice, and there are times when, uh, when that happens. And there are also times when there's not enough of it, and I think Evan um, uh, has pointed some of those out. But, but the, the fact of that doesn't mean that... I, I feel the panel is kind of, uh, and some people in the audience, are searching for some sort of elusive um, uh, uh, formula in which we say evidence should have this role or that role. What we have to do is to call out those times that there's a failure of political leadership and to call out those times when the government doesn't listen to evidence uh, that's there. Just because you don't think that evidence is the top and bottom of every decision doesn't mean that the government shouldn't answer to why they failed to listen to it, particularly if they've commissioned it, uh, but why they failed to listen to it. And that is, for my mind, a fully rounded discussion uh, which, which establishes political leadership, but also asks that we, we you know, ask penetrating questions about the basis on which decisions are made. Um, I'm all for evidence in a scientific sense being there, but I think evidence of what people want should come from how they vote. I was fascinated and absolutely horrified by uh, David Willett's suggestion that uh, he thought it was quite important that we should take into account um, some of the scientific evidence, for example, from uh, the uh, evolutionary biologists. So uh, could it go something like this, that uh, will the evolutionary biologists tell us that we, because of our Neolithic brains, can't handle sugar, and that's why we overeat it and get fat, that that's a, that's a good reason for us then to develop policies on uh, uh, obesity. And you know, because we're, we're determined by that, we can't really have much control over ourselves. Now, I just wondered if you could perhaps explain why these uh, rather dubious scientific theories were, were he, in his view, um, so important to take into account in his political decisions. The government simply doesn't have the political uh, will and ability to make a political and moral uh, case for policy. So they do hide behind <coughs> the evidence. And what's even more interesting is that mostly the evidence doesn't exist. If we think about all the arguments about early intervention, for example, and neuroscience, in fact, there is no evidence to justify sure start and early intervention, for example. So there's a sort of double problem going on, is where it's not even a reliance on actual evidence. A tendency to develop models, processes of scientific assessment and so on and so forth, which have emerged at the same time as we've seen a political dash to the centre, to the point where in fact now it doesn't matter who you vote for, the government always gets in. Um, and and th quite honestly, I found it really hard to slide a piece of paper between the three major parties at the last election. 
one or two issues there were big differences but by and large I could not slide a piece of paper between uh, between that's very different from the world that I left when I moved to the US in the uh, uh, in the in the late 1970s and I'll just close it by saying there's always an alternative and whenever anybody says to me there's always there's, there is no alternative I start looking for the one they don't want me to see <laughs> uh, and the claim that there is no there is no alternative is the way to close down debate yes. not the way to open it up between Sarah Palin and Jackie Smith I much prefer to see in politics the Sarah Palins, who are ideologues, who don't pretend uh, that the evidence is something. They say, I believe, and therefore this is my policy, as opposed to someone who, who lambasts someone who disagrees with them and claims that they're doing something on the basis of the evidence when they're patently not. I think that's far more dangerous for democracy than someone who, who is an, an ideologue who you can agree or disagree with. What's peculiar is that as we have that insecurity about politics and political possibility, I think paradoxically as our knowledge base expands, we have a similar kind of insecurity about the authority uh, of knowledge. And if you like, the way that that uh, uh, demonstrates itself is in our uh, uh, tendency to be prepared to understand that what science and knowledge and the production of understanding of the world are really about is evidence. <laughs> so if you like, uh, both sides uh, uh, actually end up limiting and diminishing uh, what each other really mean. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is my concern with our obsession with evidence-based policy. It's far deeper concern, I would say, than the question of which bits of evidence we use and how we use them uh, in particular discussions. Uh, politics and the role of politics. Ideology, well, but certainly values and the kind of values or the kind of character of a government does matter. It's not, of course, the job of politicians in contemporary Britain to provide people with some kind of massive ideological clash of the sort that might provide political excitement if you had a bunch of Marxists arguing with a bunch of libertarians, but might not be quite where the centre of gravity of the electorate is to be found. You shouldn't be surprised in democratic politics. By and large, politicians right want to be roughly where the centre of gravity of the British electorate is to be found. Um, it may not be quite as intellectually stimulating as other ways of conducting politics, but it bloody well meets the requirements of our liberal democracy. Now, the, the, uh, the polit and, and I think people are expecting different things of politicians. Sometimes we are told that we have to stand up to an irrational electorate. And other times we're told, well, once people have voted for a programme, our job is to deliver it. And I think uh, the, the role of uh, politicians and politics uh, needs to be uh, understood a bit more subtly. We have to reflect back the values of the country that we represent. Anything else wouldn't pass muster in a modern democracy. But of course, you can appeal to evidence, you can push things along, and especially in government. One of the big differences between opposition and government is that it is one of the reasons, I think, for being in government, is government gives you a better chance of winning an argument than you can in opposition. It's almost impossible in opposition to win an argument. Um, it is possible in government to try to uh, influence the way people uh, understand a problem and to respond to it. And that, change, that kind of ability to contribute and shift the national conversation is one of the things that governments can do, and I hope increasingly in modern Britain we do so by drawing on evidence.